Hi everyone, it is 6.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on September the 3rd, 2021 years most likely from something. We just don't know what. Today, I guess I'm going to, this will probably be a supplements video because it doesn't really fall into any category of any of the, uh, the series is, is that I'm uh, currently doing. I will be soon uh, producing another uh, Let's Consider Luke. Um, hopefully, pretty soon, another uh, The Obrey Hours, uh, because that one is a very, very weighty material in that one. And um, actually, the reason that I haven't produced any videos in at least a few days or so is because I've been working on it is uh it, it it's just an updated edition of one, uh, probably the first serious presentation i ever did years ago and i entitled it the the patriarchs their livestock and the land now since i've been going back over it for weeks now um editing it for really editing it for time uh the, the material was was really all over the place and it was very long very dense in information and it had to be because what I was doing was I was examining based on biblical figures given um, what we should look at as far as what they would require in the land in which they were dwelling and this is very important when comparing the uh, the viability of the Palestine and Middle East the Levant model to what we experience in the record of the Bible, and, you know, and, and how does that translate to reality? So, I always like the idea because it, it's a, a very good foundation. Um, the information is very good as far as, as being good foundational information for examining the viability of the Levant, of Palestine, of Egypt. For these things, okay. Um, so in the course of doing this, uh, as I said, it's it's taken a really long time because of how dense the material is. Um, I actually have uh, flow charts that I produced, w which actually represent things like population growth and necessary amounts of livestock based on that pop the population growth numbers. You know, present populations. Uh, it, it does examine uh, things like, for instance, you know, can a, an entire population live almost exclusively off of just animal products? So we're talking about essentially meats, uh, milks, and products made from milks and meats, which the answer is yes. And, and in fact, uh, the more I, I read on, for instance, uh, Tartars, Mughals, Siths, which are, are populations that uh, historically, we see as these um, these sort of roving populations. Though I think they all ended up somewhere. I think they were they were just journeying from Upper East Asia, which was one of the uh, fastest ways, or just Upper Asia and Upper East Asia to get through the Anian Seaway from North America to Asia. That's why we had. Uh, at various times in the past, these extremely large populations of people, and the more you, you research into it, the more you see that a lot of these populations were white, or they had with, uh, with them, mixed with them, non-white populations, which uh, upon careful examination of the material in the Bible, you'll see that that's not an odd thing, that was a common thing. Not mixing in the sense of, of genetically mixing, uh, unless we're talking about some populations that were seen as um, not good, not a good thing. Um, we were all made uh, distinct. All the peoples were made distinctly. There's all the evidence in the world to point to that, and, and that's a good thing. And we all have, I think, very good and harmonious roles that we can fulfill. I know there's some people that are hardcore separationists. You know, they, they say that we should all be separated. Um, the problem with that is how that 
works out realistically if, if you think about it. And we can look at populations where, let's say, a more decent or a more moral white population was mixed in with a non-white population. And what that did is that worked out very harmoniously for both or let's say multiple populations because there, there have been um, circumstances in which a, a more moral or more decent uh, white population than the one that is currently running things, and I will define that a little more as I go, white and why I am calling them white, and what the problem is with the word white, because everybody who's listened to me for a while knows that I've got a serious issue with even the term white. There are instances like South Africa in which there were multiple different um, non-white races or ethnicities living there who were for the most part working for um, were, and I'm going to keep saying white populations, um, Dutch, German, uh, maybe English and, and so forth were working for them. And, um, and this was actually quite harmonious, the sort of structure that there was there. Everyone was, was very well taken care of. So the idea that some people have where they're, they're radical separatists that, you know, um, white people should just be to themselves and all others should be kept away from them. I'm not sure if that's the most harmonious way for us people to interact. And I, I don't know if that, if that was really what, what the plan was for how we, we were to interact as different races that have, uh, we'll say, different talents or designed in different ways and so on and so forth. That's, that's one of the reasons I've been going um, at length and in detail through the, the origins portions of uh, the Obrey Hours, which the next, the next one likely won't be concentrating on origins because it's another issue that's a very, very important issue. Now, having said all that, Going back through this presentation from a long time ago, the patriarchs, their livestock and the land. One thing that I had to do to make absolutely sure that, that everything I was claiming was, was right on the money as far as the numbers go and how they re uh, reflect reality, I had to go back into all of the, the tables and charts that I had developed whether they were uh, by way of spreadsheets. And the spreadsheet charts, uh, what they do is they, they, they apply through, uh, through the, the data that I input into the cells. They apply certain, um, certain mathematics, and they will apply that over a certain time period. And then I can show you over a certain time period something like how a population grew. I can show you something like uh, how a population grew and here is how many pounds of meat they needed if they were living off of animal products. And I know I veered off course, but yeah, those, those populations like the Siths, the Moguls, the Tartars, they were known to live entirely off of animal products, off the, the products of the herds and the animals that they had. And they were extremely healthy, very virile people. So yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely possible and viable. And actually, you'd be very, very healthy living that way. So I'm sorry I forgot to say that as I veered off. But that's the point of the charts and the tables um, that, that I include in that presentation, the patriarchs, their livestock, and the land. So what I want to do is talk to you a bit about having to go back over all of those tables and those numbers and the calculations and figures and formulas and tell you something that I noticed that is very, uh, that's, it's very alarming and disconcerting, and it's something that I think we need to pay very close attention to um, because of its its really horrible implications. Okay, so here's the score. I was going back over population growth rates. Because in the Bible, there are various times where we are actually given numbers that help us to understand population growth. Okay, and we can compare this to real world situations, real world records of population growth, and we can see if these things are realistic or not. 
So in the course of this paper, what I did was I went and found relatively recent studies on population growth in various countries. And I took the population growth. I, I, I also had to do a lot of demographic studies to make sure what the what uh, common demographics typically were and so that I could apply them to the Bible. And the, the reason for that is starting in Exodus forward, and you'll even see it in, in Genesis too, you don't really get the numbers of women and you don't really get the numbers of, say, young babies, like even boys, or maybe like really old men, okay? You mostly get the numbers in the Bible of men that are about 20 years old up to the time that they can't really fight or, or work anymore. Basically about 20 to retirement age, sort of. Um, when you consider the, the much longer life that people lived and how active and virile they were to those older ages, that does sort of change that number quite a bit. And and those are things that are kind of gray areas, and I, I did avoid those a lot. And I actually, what I did was, um, in presenting the numbers and the formulas, calculations, and everything that I presented, uh, I actually went to the low end of every possible spectrum I could to give Palestine or the, the Levant the advantage, like the benefit of the doubt, okay? So a lot, what I'm going to tell you about, it, it, it's all numbers and figures and equations that are skewed to the low end. I'm taking Bible numbers and I'm skewing them all to the low end. And really, anyone could actually, if I wanted to, I could make a whole nother presentation showing you why I shouldn't do that, why they should be skewed far higher than that, because there's a lot of information in there that shows us that a lot of numbers would have likely have been far higher, okay? So what I did was, I'm going back over all of my formulas for growth rates. Now, when you look into these things, you, you have to look into... Uh, a few things. You, you have to look into demographics and you have to look into a lot of varying demographics. You need to look into varying demographics by race, varying demographics by culture and location. You need to consider um, inorganic factors, perhaps. You need to consider factors that are possibly specific to race and so on and so forth when you're considering demographics. And when I say demographics, I'm simply just meaning demographics in a certain population by race specifically, because that's important. You need to uh, keep like with like when you're looking at demographics, because that's exactly what the Bible's doing. When the Bible talks about Israel, it's talking about demographically a certain race of people, a certain kind or type of people. So if you're comparing other demographics, you need to stick with um, I'm going to look at a population that is all homogenous racially because that will help me reflect more accurately in this presentation that I'm doing. So you look at all of those, and then you need to study exponential population growth. That's really important, and you need to get those numbers correct. Because if the Bible tells us that, say, so many people came into Mitzram at a certain time, and so many people exited Mitzram at a certain time. And all of these people are the genetic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we have a homogenous people that have a population that is blank at this time and is, you know, blank or X at this time. And then we can take those numbers. We can calculate percentage of growth. And we can calculate exponential growth rate. Um... And we can apply those to other situations. We can extrapolate, and that's the beauty of having certain situations that you can you can look at, you can assess, um, assess, uh, sorry, and then you can extrapolate uh, those figures that you end up with uh, to other situations in a, a pretty honest and pretty accurate way if you consider all of the information which is exactly what I tried to do. And I'm going over all of this to make sure that all of it was correct and all of it was accurate. Now, 
I won't be able to release this presentation as soon as I had hoped to, which was going to be in just a few days, and here's the reason why. I got all the way through this. I did all of the editing I thought was necessary. I added a lot of the prophetic passages, um, which would point to the actual location where these events took place in, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. So the presentation is actually quite different than the original one was, which I still have published on most of my platforms. It is quite different, and it, um, it it's far more informative in a number of ways, and it also makes a far, far stronger case for the actual location that these events took place in. I was right towards the end, one or two paragraphs from my conclusion in recording this, because I went over the whole thing, edited it uh, the first time, then started recording it, and what I did was I edited it as I recorded it. Uh, so that it would be more fluent, and I, I fixed some things that I, I didn't catch before. Now, there was a point that I was doing where I was actually comparing the world's population as according to the mainstream establishment sources from the year 1800 to the year 2015. The reason for this is because of the, the time frames. It's the same time frame as what we have in the Bible. The time that the patriarchs were in Canaan until they went to Mitzram was 215 years. Then their time in Mitzram from the time Jacob and his family entered until they left as Israel right after the, uh, the ten, 10 plagues and Passover, so the Exodus, is 215 years. Those two blocks of time are each 215 years. That's why I did a comparison to world population from 1800 to 2015. Just to, to give, uh, it was just a kind of a portion that was uh, uh, contrasting, okay? What I realized as I was recording it was that when I presented this in the original presentation, I made a mistake in the fact that when I took the calculation of the uh, the claimed numbers of world population, I plugged those into the wrong equation. You see, what I did was, I, I took, so, the establishment figure for world population in 1800 is 1 billion. That's establishment figure. And the establishment figure for world population in 2015 is like 7.2 billion. 1 billion in 1800, 7.2 billion in 2015, 215 years, okay. And what happened was, I did the wrong equation, I just applied the wrong equation to that world's population number in that one point. Now the rest of the math that I did, the spreadsheets and everything else throughout that presentation, if you were to watch it, those are all correct. I have checked all of them again and against multiple equations because there's a number of different ways that you can go about equating exponential population growth and yearly population growth and come up with your percentages and so on and so forth okay so i've gone over all of those now all of those still reflect very accurate and very correct calculations so those are not they're not off and, and they're not skewed but what was off was what I applied to world population. Um, I made the mistake of using the formula that one can use for a year. If you have a if you have a shift of any kind in one year, you can apply a simple formula to that, and that will show you percentage increase in that year. You can't take that same formula and apply it to many years because it gets thrown off real badly because you're not you're not applying proper exponential rates to that so what you're going to get back is something very incorrect okay so i was i was applying the right formulas and the right numbers to the biblical information and i was getting everything correct on all of that but when I got to the world's population, I took those numbers 
and I plugged them into the wrong equation. And what I got back was a 3% growth rate over those 215 years. Now, I don't know why I didn't recognize this when I had first done this presentation. And it probably was because that presentation was so data dense that by the time I got to that, it was just one of those things that I missed. But in going back over it, one thing I realized was this. I, I looked at it again and I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. That makes no sense at all because if I use this, the, the, the same equation, what I did was I took the equation that gave me a 3% growth rate for the world from 1800 to 2015 and I applied that to my uh, Canaan growth rate. You see, as part of this presentation, what I did was I took the number and this was, this was actually, again, like I said, all the numbers were skewed downwards um of the camp of people that Abraham had with him it would have been around 1135 people okay and what i did was i applied a very modest growth rate based on other growth rates natural good growth rates given in the bible in other times i i applied a lower version of the growth rate that Israel enjoyed in Mitzrim over the 215 years they were there. And that, that was super modest too, because 80 years or so before they left uh, Mitzrim, so I mean a third of the time before they left Mitzrim, the Pharaoh there had instituted um, infanticide, okay, among other hardships that they had. Okay, so there was there was a 4.5% growth rate that we see reflected in the amount of people that Israel had when they exited Mitzram. And this is extremely fair because when you look at a number of population growth studies in certain homogenous peoples, just in our own time, in the last 30 to 50 years, there are, are population growths that are pushing 8 to 10%. So there's nothing weird about this population growth. This is totally acceptable. This is absolutely fine. There's there nobody could come out there and say, "Oh, that's that's just unreasonable." It's not. It's it's far 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 within the realm of reason to have a 4.5% annual population growth while Israel was in Mitzrayim. And then what I did was I took that and I applied that to the population that we know Abraham would have had based on demographics when he first came into Canaan and that was 1135 souls and if you apply only a 3% per annum growth rate to that by the time he leaves Canaan he would have about half a million souls that would be the growth that that's not the growth of his genetic seed okay his genetic seed being and that doesn't count Esau or others it doesn't count Ishmael and the other children we're just talking about from Isaac Abraham to Isaac Isaac had two sons we're only counting one of those sons Jacob and Jacob had 12 sons and the one daughter recorded, and then they went down to Mitzram about the time Joseph was around 40. And we, we can do calculations of all of these time frames. We can end up with the amount of times they were there. We can end up with the amount of population. We can, we can end up with population growth. So I took off, just to give the advantage to Palestine, I took off 1.5% per annum and applied that to 1,135 people, which based on demographics, that is a good and modest number that he would have had coming in to Canaan. And that's how I ended up with about half a million people would be the growth rate. Again, not half a million people from his genetic seed through Isaac and Jacob. He had a lot more people with him than were his genetic seed. But I won't spend a lot more time on that. What I want to illustrate to you is something 
in my estimation, a, a living nightmare. And something that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense in reality either. And there's, there's more implications to it than I can, than I can really begin to even think about right now. I've been sitting here thinking about it for maybe an hour now before I decided to make this. Now figure something. I have this little calculator here. Now in the uh, the document, the Patriarchs of Livestock and the Land, I go through how to actually do these calculations. So I don't just use an online calculator or anything. I tell you exactly how you can plug the numbers in and get the exponential growth rates and how you can plug the numbers in and you can get a yearly percentage like a per annum growth rate. So I show you exactly how it can be done and how it absolutely makes sense. You know, the, these, aren't, these aren't abstract numbers that we can't really apply or understand how they work in the real world. This stuff is explained. But for the ease of, of what I'm doing here, I'm just going to show you this is a, a, a calculator. It's found at omnicalculator.com. It is the exponential growth calculator. They have an exponential growth calculator, okay? And what I can do is if I put in, we'll, we'll do this in percentages, okay? We'll say in 1800, they say the, the world's population was 1 billion. And then to 2015, that gives us 215 years. And I'm going to I'm going to get rid of this percentage number cuz you can plug in the numbers as you need and it'll adjust based on the numbers you plug in, okay? Now they say we had 7.6 billion in 2015. Or yeah, so it's 215 years from the year 1800. Oh, I'm sorry. They said not 7.2 billion okay so what that does is that gives us a uh, a growth rate change the exponential growth rate is at 0.922 percent so there's a lot about this that we could think about one thing is if i plug that number into let's say one of my charts we'll take uh not mitzram let's just let's do canaan we'll take the time in canaan now i have canaan set up to where it, it is at a three percent annual growth rate okay and the 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 third column here is is how much they grew in a year so if abraham started out at year one and he had 1135.7 people the growth rate is at 3%. So 34 people would be the difference between those being born and those dying in a year with that sort of population at a 3% growth rate. And that would get them at the end of the year 1,169.8. That's how this works. So I didn't put in the individual birth rates versus death rates. It's just growth rate. So if you see a growth rate percentage, that calculates the the difference between birth rate and death rate and there you have your growth rate okay so if i put that number in the first cell in here uh what will happen is this is uh, essentially libra offices ver version of excel okay and so i can i can just program these cells to act a certain way and i put that number 1 billion here in my first cell because I want to calculate everything. This is going to make these numbers just insane, by the way. <laughs> Thing. Definitely don't want to save it like this. So if I just put that in at a 3% growth rate, 3% growth rate, folks, look, it, it, if you check um, just in the last 50 years, various populations, growth rates, and try to stick with populations that you can find that are homogenous. You know, um, so-called third world countries and things like that. And you look at their growth rates uh, over time. You'll see that a 3% growth rate's not high. It's really not. There's, there's growth rates that are far higher than that, okay? And, and that's not counting um, emigration at all, right? 
you'll see that this is really fair. I'm not using crazy growth rates. So to get to what I saw in 215 years of world history from 1800 to 2015, that was from 1 billion to 7.2 billion. Now, in order to do that at just a 3% growth rate, which is not excessive, but is just nominally healthy growth rate, nominally healthy growth rate of the patriarch's time in Canaan, that would only take 69 years to reach that 7.2 billion number that we had to reach in 215 years. So if I went down to the 215 year mark that I have uh, plugged in here, we would actually be at 511 billion at a simple 3% growth rate. So what you got to figure is this. <laughs> <clears throat> in order for the world, the whole world's population, if they're counting the whole world's population as they know it, and, and think about this for a second, please. Think about the tools and the abilities we had to count people in the year 1800 and, and how um, inferior they were and would have been to the abilities and the tools that we have today to count population. So I would say that it would be pretty fair to even think that the population could have been a pretty good deal higher than that in 1800 than what they had on record because they, ju they just did not have anywhere near the abilities that they would have today to keep a more accurate count of population, population growth, and all of the various peoples in the world, and so on and so forth, okay? And, and what, that, what that implies is that the population growth rate over those 215 years was probably even lower percentage-wise than it is now. What that means is this, that growth rate, just the one that I showed you, that 0.922%, in order to maintain a growth rate that low requires a hell of a lot of death. It requires a hell of a lot of death. Now, if we look back in, uh, in the, the Bible record, and we see that populations can grow, um, specifically the population of Abraham and, and others, Adamites, that they can grow very quickly, if unimpeded by death. Um, that death, usually in the Bible, that the death came through war, um, you know, genocide, infanticide, when it happened and when it came, would come through that. Now, yeah, sometimes uh, we have in the Bible record that, that Yahweh would strike uh, a, a whole population of people in some way or another. Uh, fair enough. In the last 215 years, we don't have near enough occurrences of that other than claims. We have claims that it, even today seem to be falling apart. Claims of, of plagues that don't seem to be organic at all. The Spanish flu, that nothing about that strikes me as being an actual organic thing. Viruses to me um, don't strike me as being reasonable to believe in them. Um, it seems more reasonable to believe in things like poison, um, manipulation, and what we see as we go back, we see not only what would appear to be mass poisonings in, in a lot of different ways, whether that be in, you know, like the... Um, 
in the sense of of electrical poisoning like uh, RF poisoning and today you know we have uh, far higher incidence of, of RF electromagnetic poisoning um, chemical poisoning as well um, some of these things um, seem incidental but most of them don't and um, when you start poking into let's say wars wars in white populations what white predominantly white population areas over the last 215 years and I know today it's 2021 but we'll just figure 1800 to 2015 so from 1800 on the amount of wars that you see are uh, they're unbelievable catastrophically unbelievable and then when you consider not only that but if that was the only factor there was there would, the numbers would actually reflect negative it wouldn't even be growth it would be decline however at the same time we know that for at least a century and probably much much longer than that the resources of whites Europeans so on and so forth have been being taken by these people who appear white um, and again are they white yeah kind of sort of and that's the problem with the term white they have been taking the resources um, and the blessings of people that are not quite part of their tribe and they have been they've been stealing them they have been reallocating them they have been stealing massive numbers of so-called white people Israelite people and maybe a lot of whites who are not Israelites because not all whites are Israelites that's uh, that's that's such an un unrealistic notion and have been selling them into slavery to non-whites which would inevitably breed them out because that's the only reason why uh, some brown who came into whatever wealth they had usually very inorganically by way of these people and what you know their uh, their trafficking networks they would just breed them out they would castrate the males they would uh, the the women would they would just they were sex objects and they would breed uh, other children with them which would be one of the reasons why you would have so many uh, so many people living in in the Middle East or in areas of Africa India Asia that would have uh, a lot of Caucasian features because of this worldwide trafficking market that's gone on for centuries now so while they are employing uh, more tactics than I can even con conceive right now to keep down the population of all other Caucasians which they see as their direct competition essentially and I would posit to you that they see the Israelites among the Caucasians as their greatest problem and threat and they would be doing as much as possible to um, to kill them and to ruin their seed kill their seed this is serious serious business and they've been about it for a very long time so while they're doing that they're also stealing all the produce that they possibly can from us and they are putting it into non-white countries this is exactly how China has become a superpower or perceived as a superpower because it's not really the Chinese that are running and directing everything going on there that's how India has become to look like a superpower that's how many of these non-white nations have grown in populations by leaps and bounds because they've taken so much of our food so much of our technology so many of our patents they have taken them over over to all of these non-white nations and grown their population numbers which would not ever grow like that if left to their own devices so if you consider the fact that in 215 years the population has only grown at 0.922 percent 
you also must consider that a lot of that, especially going forward from 1800, especially in the last century or so, has been non-white populations being inorganically grown by these people as armies against us. So at the same time that they are growing these other populations by leaps and bounds, they are murdering the shit out of us at scales to which it is very, very difficult to comprehend. And an interesting thing in all of this, while all of this has been going on, and we know these people have been effecting revolutions in the countries that we've been living in in Europe for centuries now. There was the English Revolution slash Civil War. There was the French Revolution. There was the Bolshevik Revolution. There were all kinds of various smaller revolutions and genocides that they have pulled off on um, on various, we'll say, various segments and degrees of, of white or Caucasian populations because they do, um, they do differ. I mean, there was the, um, the Armenian genocide, and, and Armenians are not the same as, say, German whites. They're different, of course. Um, and I'm not sure that we know all that much about that and, and who they were exactly genociding and why in that instance. But you have these people that they are growing and they, they we have every reason based on what we can observe in why a population of a certain specific genetic demographic people would increase do you understand that you can get the numbers um that tell you why a population of a certain specific demographic would be more likely to increase. And, and these numbers, they, they, follow, they follow patterns, okay? So if you take a population, a homogenous, specific population of people, and let's say that for centuries, they have been taking the, 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 the wealth and the strength uh, from another people for centuries, and they have been reallocating it to themselves and those other that are racially like unto them. What would be the reason for this? this? The reason for this would be to increase their numbers, therefore increase their strength. But I want you to look at something that doesn't make any sense at all. At all. Um, we are going to take, for instance, a look at, let's get to, I was hoping to get to 45, hmm. We'll take like 42. Okay, so there's a lot of argument over this, but there's enough sources out there that if you look into it pretty close, you'll find out what the real deal is. Now, the official sources out there were claiming that the J population was at about 15 million in 1945. And of course, this is a point of, of contention because those sources really reported this and it was an absolute fact and they have done everything in their power to try to say that that's not the case because of, you know, that thing they claim that happened which is complete bullshit back in the 30s and 40s. What happens is this. If you put in the figure, let's say, 15 million to this calculator, and we'll go to 2015 just like the last one, okay? So that gives us 70 years, okay? Let's put in 70 years. 70 years at 15 million. Oh, and let me just show you this real quick. Chapter 7, this is, um, this is a, a J reference, okay? 
At the beginning of 2015, the world's Jewish population was estimated at 14 million. 14 million. They're trying to tell us that it's at 14 million today when world almanacs were telling us it was 15 million in the 30s and the 40s. Now, let's do this. We'll clear out the last number, put it at zero. And this number, let's put in that world's population growth. It had to be at 0.922. Okay, 0.922 percent population growth and we'll put in 15 million for the starting figure over 70 years. At the same population growth as the average of people in the world and we know that the so-called white population has actually been so far down it's been in decline for a very very long time and that the non-white population has actually been increased a lot so this isn't really all that fair because the fact is they mostly live in white countries and because they feed so much off of white people their population or percentage growth rate should actually be quite a bit higher than this 0.922 percent that I'm applying here over 70 years, but even at that, it puts us at 28.5 million in 70 years from 15. If we want to go down to their cooked up numbers in 1945, and of course it's going to be 12 million because 12 is two sixes. But we'll just put it in at that, over 70 years at that same growth rate, you know, the world growth rate, 0.922%, it would be 22 million. Now listen, again, if you check, uh, if you check average demographic and growth rates over various places at various times and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, you'll find that just as I stated earlier that 3%, just 3% is actually modest. And for a population of people that have so much wealth and resources that they've been stealing from the people they've been murdering for hundreds of years, 3%, 3% is almost like laughable that they would have a 3% as low as a 3% growth rate. It'd be laughable. So let's just figure that for 70 years at a 3% growth rate. That would be 95 million at a 3% growth rate. Now, if any of you pay attention to, let's just say, news stories or little things you see, you know that these people have as big of families as you could possibly imagine. They do. And don't think they don't have plenty of bastards running around and all kinds of half and quarter mixes with other races. I'm just talking about their homogenous population. From 12 million in 1945, which is their claimed number with the incident that they claim occurred, which is complete bullshit. But just at 12 million from 45, 70 years at a 3% growth rate, which is a joke. It could be far higher and probably is far higher. We get them at 95 million. But let's put, let's put a more reasonable, let's say for a, if you had a group of people that had the overwhelming amount of resources and thus abilities to grow families that had pretty much no limits in their size. Let, let's put them at the growth rate that we see Israel enjoying in Mitzram. And this is a percentage growth rate, not counting all of the infanticide done for the last third of their time there. So this actually, this rate should be far higher than what I'm putting in. 4.5%. 4.5%. Modest. Over 70 years. Where does that put them? That puts them at a quarter billion quarter billion. Do you want to know why all the normies have such a hard time spotting them 
and understanding the difference between them and white, and why those who are wise to him see him everywhere. Because when you plug in reasonable growth rates to an exponential growth rate calculator, that's what you come up with. You come up with numbers like quarter billion, quarter billion. You know, I don't like E. Michael Jones. I think he's a shill and a gatekeeper, but a broken clock is right twice a day, right? And what E. Michael Jones, the point that he made when he did that last debate with Jared Taylor was, he said, when you, using a term like white, and this is why he goes on and on about the, the term white people being a ridiculous term, and he's right, because it is a ridiculous term. We are various ethnicities and various tribes within a much broader race. And that's why people mistake them for white because, first off, I mean, it's hard to say how much admix any given one of them has with Turk or Mongolian. That's why they're called Turk or Mongolian. And a lot of the research I've been doing into the East and the, uh, the Tartars and the migrations and the Mughals and various things that happened over there, there's a very good reason why they're called Turco-Mongolian. But let's say they don't have a huge mix of Turco-Mongolian. They would still be mistaken for, in, in general, white. That's why you would have so many demographic, not demographic, I'm sorry, uh, um, census data from the uh, early America that would have so many white slave owners. Because they knew a long time ago, if we call everybody this, if we call everybody this blanket term, then we're invisible. And that's exactly what E. Michael Jones said. He literally said, when you call the Jew white, they become invisible. That's the problem I have with everybody out there, and I don't care who they are. I don't care if they have good intentions or bad intentions. Everyone out there who uses the term white, because it's a, it's a first off, it's a meaningless term. At best, what you're describing is a, a huge uh, group, as in a kind, and the problem is, most of the people that you're distinguishing from the whites, because people say, well, there's whites and there's Jews and they're different. No, Jews, anybody looks at a picture of most Jews, they'll say they're white. Unless they're a Mizrahi Jew, and then they look more Arab or dark. There's a reason why words like white are part of our common vocabulary. Or black, brown, yellow, whatever because they don't adequately describe who we are as tribes, ethnicities, you understand? And it makes these people invisible. It makes them invisible and it hides their numbers. And when, a, and when one people is making war on another people, the one thing they want to do, check the art of war, they want to hide their numbers. And I posit to you that not only are they hiding their numbers, they are hiding the numbers of all of the offspring that they've produced as admix offspring as well. You can see a lot of these in the huge amount of Sephardic names that you see applied not only to uh, Latinos, but a lot of other people running around there that have Sephardic names that nobody is paying any attention to because they think, well, if they look white, they're all right. And that's where the war is coming from. We have to stop using these destructive terms. We have to stop letting them hide. We have to stop letting them be invisible. We have to stop letting them murder so many of us, while they are stealing so much of our resources. And the only way to do that, we're not going to do that by strength, might, power. We had plenty of that a hundred years ago and still didn't stop this. 
there's only one solution that nobody out there has thoroughly tried, and that is to understand what the Bible said in the first place very well so that we can understand the precepts of the law because everything about the precepts of the law have to do with whether or not we are going to get through this and have our children carry on our names whether we are going to be able to live some kind of a decent life without having all of our wealth stolen from us and not just wealth but these people are are child rapists they are uh, fucking animals that's what that's what and that's what we have to deal with and this is what the situation probably more accurately looks like what I'm showing you here and I wish people who say that they are advocates of the so-called quote-unquote whites would stop talking about solutions that have anything to do with us using any kind of strength strength of mind or our own power to deal with this we need to understand what the law says and we need to do that as a people because the law is the contingency that is what how we are going to live how prosperous or how cursed we are going to be has everything to do with that check Deuteronomy 28 even with corrupted translations you can get the feel of what's being said in Deuteronomy 28 that's our solution and I don't want anybody out there saying by by saying that I'm I'm denigrating Christ or his role in any way don't pull that crap with me I don't think most people out there really understand the role that he served in redemption I don't think most people out there even understand redemption or why redemption was needed or who it was for or how it applied so I I don't I don't want to hear any of that crap because a lot of that pontificating uh, on this idea that um the the evangelical catholic evangelical idea of Christ and eschatology is going to get us through this w without rethinking whether or not we have even interpreted him who he was his role what he in fact did what that accomplished you know quantifying qualifying understanding those those words that that we take for granted or or misapply misappropriate like sozo but i'll stop there because i'm i'm at just about an hour and i just wanted to bring some of these things to your attention and try to impress with as much force as I can what some of these things mean and, and imply and and I do want to just one more time in case I didn't um, in case I didn't express this with the sort of gravity that it deserves that when I was looking at articles and figures for world population and world population growth over time I found it very interesting that you can look at a lot of studies of population growth just in our own time in all kinds of various people you can see how inorganic so-called white populations growth or decline has been and why infanticide abortion contraceptive all-out murder wars etc and poisonings of, of all different kinds okay you can see that what is absolutely bizarre is that for four millennia four millennia that's four thousand years before the year 1800 they claim that the world stayed at an even lower growth rate than by the time we get to the year 1800 with the assumed 1 billion 
Now, that, that right there is one of the reasons why there's so many people that, that talk about this reset at 1800 because there's all of these different factors, which can be interpreted, by the way, in different ways. The reset, as they've put the name on it because they label things and control the narrative. That's only one way of looking at it, right? But the utterly bizarre thing is to think that in four millennia before that, we had experienced a growth rate so minute that it doesn't even reflect anything that we can see in just regular, I mean, just average moderate growth rates. For, for 4,000 years, they say. It's utterly ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And we need to rethink all of these things. But I hope we'll, I hope we'll spend time really thinking about the implications of that tiny growth rate in 215 years of the world's history and how that applies to our population and how much straight up cold-blooded murder that implies from one party to another and everybody listening to this should know what parties I mean I'll see you next time